want to thank Aaron for his very, very kind, <laughs> overly encouraging announcement. Um, <laughs> but I am very grateful for that and, and, and genuinely grateful for your prayers as well. Um, I, I do love that we have the opportunity to serve other churches. I, I think it is a, an important mark of a healthy church when they are concerned about the health of other churches. Um, and so it's a, it's a joy to represent you in that concern that I know you share. Um, since somebody just asked me this for the point of clarification, um, th there's, there's no need for me to move uh, to fulfill this role, in case you're wondering. Um, I'm not going to cease uh, pastoring this church or, or functioning as I have done, uh, though obviously there's going to be some, um, some rescheduling of some of my uh, kind of uh, job description in that sense. It's, it's, not, a, um, it's not a majority role, uh, this regional leader role. It's a percentage. We, we think it's probably 20% or 25%, something in that range. Um, uh, but obviously the majority of my time and certainly um, the majority of my uh, priority, my responsibilities are directed, as they always have been, to serving and leading you, uh, which is really just my, my joy. There's nowhere I'd rather be uh, than serving you alongside you in this church. So thank you for your support. Thank you for your care. I look forward to being able to give you greetings from other churches and to other churches as well in this role. So I'm excited about that. Well, if you would open your Bibles to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 6. As you know, we're in a series called Real Godliness in Real Life. And We've been focusing on digging deeply into a few verses rather than often what we do on a Sunday is we'll look at a larger passage. Uh, but in this series, we've, we've chosen to focus on a few verses. And our plan typically in the preaching of this church is to walk through a book of the Bible straight through. But occasionally we'll have a series like this where we look at a topic and, and different verses throughout Scripture that relate to that topic. So we're doing this this time around. After this series, we look forward to a, an extended series in the Psalms. So just to continue to put that in front of you, we're very much excited about that. In another, uh, I think it's four weeks from now or so, uh, we will be launching that series. That will take us all the way uh, until December. Uh, so we're very excited to be getting into the Psalms in an ongoing extended way for us as a church. But for now, uh, let's look at Luke. I'm, I'm going to be uh, really just examining two verses this morning, two verses, verse 36 and 37 of Luke chapter 6. However, um, if you don't mind, I'd, I'd like to read um, a, a longer section because they're just so valuable. As, as I've looked at this passage in chapter 6, I've thought, boy, this, this is such a valuable chapter for the Christian and for the call to godliness. I can't examine all of it this morning, but, but it, is, it is such a good passage to know where it is and to return there as we consider our relationships and what godliness looks like in our relationships. So I'm going to read a lengthy number of verses, and then we're just going to zero in on verse 36 and 37. This is Jesus speaking. He says, But I say to you who hear, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. To one who strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from one who takes away your cloak, do not withhold your tunic either. Give to everyone who begs from you. And from one who takes away your goods, do not demand them back. And as you wish that others would do to you, do so to them. If you love those who love you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who are good to you, what benefit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to get back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for he is kind to the ungrateful and the evil. Now, the next two verses are where we're going to camp out this morning. Be merciful, 
even as your Father is merciful. Judge not that you will not be judged. Condemn not and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be put into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. For the purpose of focusing in this morning, we're just going to focus on those two phrases. Be merciful, even as your Father is merciful. And then judge not and condemn not. We're just going to zero in on, on those few phrases that are rich in meaning for us this morning. And may the Lord bless the preaching of his word. Have you ever had a moment where you discovered that you had put a new, brightly colored piece of clothing in with a largely light-colored or white-colored load of laundry? Have you ever had that experience? Usually, uh, you don't realize that that's happened until after it's been put through the entire process, and you are drying them and discovering that these clothes just don't look like they used to look. Uh, There is all manner of random, odd colors and shapes that are now scattered throughout the entire load. Well, I, I think we could compare that a bit to what happens when a lack of mercy is present in the heart and life of a Christian. It is as though it scatters throughout the whole load of life, discoloring one thing after another. It's it's sometimes a subtle sin. It's a sin that sometimes you're not even aware of in the moment, the moment that you put that load in, you weren't aware of what was about to happen, or you slipped in this pair of jeans with a crayon in the pocket, or any number of of catastrophes of laundry. Um, You're not aware in the moment what the consequences will be, but later on you discover And sometimes they are pervasive. And sometimes they're not limited just to the one article of clothing. They extend all over the load. Well, that's true of life and the issue of mercy and judgment as well. It's subtle in its first instance, but then it spreads and it defiles and it colors and it discolors and it ruins. It even destroys. If I can speak pastorally, I'm not aware of a more devastating sin in the life of a Christian or in the fellowship of a church than this category, the twin-sided category of mercy and judgment. It has this subtle, devious, undermining, and yet pervasively devastating effect. And I think that's why Jesus is so confrontative, so direct about this category, almost, almost abruptly so, almost surprisingly, shockingly so in his language because he is attempting to get a hold of the Christian as they are dropping that piece of clothing into the load. Wait, don't, don't do that. The effects will be devastating. Do not drop that in. Don't let it have that effect. Now, we look at these two twin verses. Obviously, the the verse 36 is in some ways a a summary of what he has been saying about loving your enemies and doing good. But I think it also introduces uh, the next number of verses. That's why I'm preaching them together. It it kind of functions as this transition verse. It looks backward at, at loving your enemies, but then this category of judgment and condemnation and forgiveness and even generosity uh, looks at some of the marks of what that mercy should and shouldn't look like. He's sort of just continuing in the same discussion. So we're just going to make two points this morning. The mercy we must reflect and the judgment we must reject. All right, just those two points. The mercy we must reflect and the judgment we must reflect. And the the entire goal of all of this is to put into the life of the church an earnestness that God's people are called to mercy. They are called to mercy, and that means they are called against judgment. Be merciful. I can't say it any more succinctly than Jesus did. Be merciful, Jesus says. And that means do not be judgmental. Don't you you dare drop judgment into the life of your relationships. Be merciful and do not be judgmental. 
So let's look at these one at a time. The mercy we must reflect. Be merciful, Jesus says, even as your Father is merciful. Now, we know in some ways instinctively, I think, what mercy is, but let's just review and reflect on some definitions. Mercy is that determination to relate to people in a helpless or undeserving situation with kindness and not indifference, with generosity and not reserve. Mercy is, is not merely a, a kind of disposition of the heart, but it's a desire to actually do good to those in need or those who should, uh, if, if they were getting what they deserved, receive anger. It's treating people in an opposite way from what their character or their, their situation might warrant. It's being surprisingly good to someone who is not good. That's what mercy is. Mercy sees someone who is unable to help themselves and actually renders it difficult for them to uh, warrant help because of their disposition, because of their anger, because of their uh, you know, out, outrage towards those around them. It, it looks to help that person rather than to hurt them. This is where it flows from loving your enemies. Be merciful, Jesus says even as your Father is merciful. Now, we are to receive this as a command. I've I've mentioned this before. We we must receive commands as commands. Jesus, uh, often as he does in, in the Gospels, there'll be some kind of moment where he establishes his authority through a miracle or through a teaching. If you look back at the, the beginning of chapter 6, you can notice just by the, the headings there that he's establishing himself as the Lord of the Sabbath. He heals the man with the withered hand. He sends out, uh, or he chooses rather, the 12 apostles. So there's these moments of authority where he's establishing that he has the right to communicate authoritatively to God's people. And then he uses that authority to issue these commands, commands that true disciples obey. That's that's the, the flow of the passage here. He's issuing a command to his people. Be merciful, he says. It is a command. It's a command that's required of us as a state of being. Notice that. It doesn't just say, do mercy or sometimes act mercifully. You notice the difference? It's, it's one of these to be verbs. Be merciful. It's to be your, your ongoing disposition towards those around you, towards those around me, is that we are called to, to be merciful. It should be a characteristic, a, a way of life, a, a way of defining how we should act in any situation. Mercy should characterize our interactions with others. It's not a, one of the checklists that we check off for maturity. No, it, it should be true in all of our actions. It should be true of us at any given moment. We could say there is mercy that is present in this interaction, this relationship. And if we're wondering why or to what degree maybe we're to show mercy, the rest of the sentence makes that clear. We're to be merciful even as your Father is merciful. And this just gets so much done in such a short phrase. Jesus is such an amazing teacher. Such a short phrase. How are we to be merciful? Even as your Father is merciful. Now, in that one phrase, he, he, he reminds these disciples, and he reminds the readers, especially after the cross and resurrection, of what kind of mercy is present in God that he has become our Father. It wasn't common uh, in the first century for Jews to, to claim the right to call God Father. He was the father of Israel in one sense, but Jesus seems to make it very personal for them. And so there is a mercy even in the name he uses of God, that God, God is under no obligation that his people should treat him as a father and they as his children. God, God's not obligated to do that. He could just be a distant deity like so many deities of the religions that are still present today. He doesn't have to be a father, a personal father. That's, that is not required or necessary of God. And so just the fact that it, it's your father indicates the kind of mercy and also just the person who's speaking. Who is speaking? It's the incarnate Son of God come from heaven to earth, taking on flesh and living in this 
state of experiencing the limitations of human nature fully and without reservation, that in itself is an expression of the mercy of God. And then the fact that the reason he is in the flesh is so that he can basically be a substitute for sinners and receive the the crushing judgment of God so that instead of them being punished by God, they can relate to God with freedom and and, 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 and access and draw near to God. And, And so the very person who's speaking illustrates, just by his very being, how merciful God is. God is that God that sees a world full of enemies, chooses to save some of them, and doesn't just do it from a distance, sends his only son to rescue and redeem at the cost of his own life. Look, look this isn't just some distant wish of mercy. This isn't just, uh, boy, you'll be in my prayers in some general way, or I, I wish you well. This is a God who actually enfleshes mercy. He, he, he lives it out to the point of, of personal death. He is so dedicated to showing mercy that he will, he will die in order to reveal it and offer it to his people. This is the God that Jesus is talking about. So when he says, be merciful, even as your father is merciful, he's combining both the motivation for mercy and the standard at the same time. The fact that we are children of the Father, and especially in a, in a biblical worldview, and today children sometimes do things different than their parents, not only in their character, but in their, their vocation. It would be much more expected in this era that, that a child just follows in the footsteps of his father by vocation. And certainly that the resemblance, the family resemblance is assumed a child is not just one who is, um, is even just physically descended. He, he's one that resembles the father. That idea is very present in the scriptures. To be a child of something is to be one who resembles and reflects and looks like the father. That, that's why Jesus can say, you are children of your father, the devil. To, to, in another place, he's, he's rebuking people. He's not saying you're physically descended from the devil. He's saying that you bear the family resemblance of the devil. And here Jesus is saying, you are to be merciful, and it just makes sense that you are because your father is the God of mercy. So the true children who are truly children of God claimed by his mercy will reflect that mercy because, first of all, they're grateful for his mercy, but also, by definition, if they're children of that father truly, they will look like him. They will resemble him. Be merciful even as your father is merciful. In other words, if you claim God as father, then certainly mercy will be a characteristic because it is certainly his characteristic. Be merciful, he says, as your father is merciful. To know God as father through the perfect sacrifice of Jesus on the cross to be reborn into the family of God is to be called to mercy, a mercy that is keeping with the source of our salvation, a mercy we receive first and that we now reflect towards others. It's a mercy that is sacrificial, it is personal, it is permanent. It looks without ceasing for the well-being of those ones who should rightly receive punishment, anger, or despair. It looks to do good to those ones who, if we're just taking into account what they deserve, they should receive punishment, distance, rejection, despair, but instead they receive uh, good and and benevolence and a desire to do them uh, kindness to to ensure their well-being. Now, as he communicates this, We need to receive this as coming from the one who fulfilled the mercy of God by dying on the cross. There is no one who understands the pain of showing mercy more than Jesus. No person. No no person has suffered greater injustice. No person has been uh, betrayed more painfully and more unjustly. No person has received the the consequences of another's uh, lying and slander and and, and anger than Jesus. So so there, there is no person that can say to Jesus Christ, look, you're asking me to show mercy. You have no idea what you're talking about. 
No, no, we're talking about Jesus. He, he knows precisely what he's talking about. He, he knows exactly, he knew exactly what was going to happen. We know that as the gospel unfolds. He knew ahead of time that his very disciples that he lived with and walked with were going to betray him. He knew his own His own people were going to turn away from him. Even his own family during his ministry thought he was insane and rejected him as as unworthy of being listed. They just wanted to take him home and get him out of the public eye. So there's no individual who can claim an experience of facing the consequences of sin, the pain of people's sin, the, the, the long suffering of sin, that, that, you can, that, that Jesus doesn't fully and completely understand the difficulty of this command. Be merciful. Listen, there is no burden we will ever have to bear greater than what Jesus bore to save us. There is no loss we will experience greater than his loss of life and even loss of fellowship with the Father in order to save us. That There is no betrayal we will experience worse than the betrayal of those that he had poured out his life for and literally never sinned against. There is simply no condition that we can point to and say, well, this is just beyond a reasonable call to mercy because we're talking about Jesus Christ. What does the cross do? The cross eliminates our objections to obedience. Doesn't it do that? It eliminates them. It eliminates our objections to obedience because from a human level, pastor, friend, we, we, we could reasonably be charged with not understanding a, a person's situation, couldn't we? If, if I were just to say to you, I think you should be merciful, you could say, well, you don't understand what I've been through, and you may be right. I, I, I couldn't act like I know what you've been through, maybe the betrayal, the sense of, of, of being sinned against, wronged. The, the sense of danger, if, if I extend mercy, uh, perhaps they'll take advantage of that in some way, relationally. You're right, I, I couldn't, no, nobody could claim to know the personal pain and difficulty that an individual is going through, but we know one who certainly can say that to all of us without exception. We know one who can say, look, look, I know what I'm talking about. I know the, the pain that it means to say, be merciful even as your father is merciful. Because he was merciful in saving us. There's no burden that we have experienced greater than the burden we laid on Jesus. We have certainly experienced burdens. Everyone has been sinned against. And you feel the pain and the weight of that. Absolutely. But, but nothing that has been done to us is greater than the full complement of our lifetime of sins laid on Jesus on the cross. There's no, there's no comparison in that. Why? Because, well, because we're not infinite. And even in the most innocent moments, we are, our sin is, is at some level involved. Unlike Jesus, who never sinned, never even failed to positively serve or to love uh, beyond uh, expectation or reason. But who of us can say that? Who of us can say, not only have we, have we, have we not done anything negative, but we've, we've loved sacrificially this person who has, has burdened us with their sins. Look, no one can claim that their life experience disqualifies this command because Jesus is the one communicating it. Be merciful. Be merciful to those who, who don't deserve mercy. That's the whole point of his earlier section. Look, look. obviously you can be kind to people who will be kind back, who haven't hurt you, who will give you something in return. Obviously, what's different between you and, 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 and a sinner who obviously does that? What he's saying is, look, if you want to be marked as one who is born from a different lineage, then be merciful to those who should rightly deserve rejection. Then you will be like your father. And your Savior. The mercy 
the mercy we must reflect. Secondly, the judgment we must reject. This happens a lot in Scripture uh, because sometimes we, we look for loopholes and sometimes stating something positively and negatively. Uh, this happens in contracts, too, if you've ever had the, the joy and privilege of reading contracts. Uh, sometimes there, there's positive and negative. It just kind of it just hems you in. It just eliminates even the assumption of a loophole. Yep, do this and also don't do this. In case you thought you could. So this is what this, this I think, phrase does in these piling of phrases. It just, it just points us. Where does it point us to? It points us right to a need for ongoing encounters with the cross because only at the cross can you obey these commands. It doesn't allow us to trust in our own strength, to assume that our personality is nicer than others, uh, to assume we can just run away and escape and find some newer, nicer group of people. It, it doesn't allow us to do that. It forces us to go the only place where we can find fresh grace and motivation and an encounter that can motivate us to do this. So he just hedges us in, but he hedges us in kindly because the only space left other than disobedience is at the foot of the cross. The judgment we must Reject. Judge not, Jesus says, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. And that's as much as I felt like I could get to this morning. Just those two phrases. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. These are really just saying a similar thing in a repetitive way to make the point uh, very clear and emphasize. Do not judge, and do not condemn. Now, now in, in order to... Um, to communicate this, I, I want to walk through a couple of caveats uh, so that we can feel the force of what Jesus is actually saying, all right? So I'm sure you could anticipate these, but let me just walk through this. Uh, in prohibiting judgment, Jesus is not calling for ignorance, as if Christians cannot actually discern the difference between good and evil. He's not forbidding righteous anger where we are offended by anything that displeases the Lord because of our concern for his glory or that harms any person. So he's not acting as though if we are aware of a sin that is harming a person, there isn't a, a righteous anger or offense that rises up and a desire to protect that person. Or that we wouldn't be offended by, say, uh, the egregious taking of the, the name of the Lord in vain. That there would be an offense for the holiness of God. He, he's not saying that's judgment. He's not saying that we're unable to call sin, sin. Why? Well, I'm not a judge. Who am I to say? No, no, that, that's not what he's speaking of here, clearly, because the Bible commends all of those things. It commends righteous anger. It commends calling sin, sin, and not righteousness. And it commends a desire to protect victims of wrongdoing. So, so those can't be what he's referring to. So we have to kind of narrow in, what is he talking? He's also not rejecting speaking the truth to those who need loving correction. Obviously, you just read the book of Hebrews. We're, we're called to, to admonish each other away from unbelief. Not speaking of those things. So what, what's left that is the focus here? Well, he is rejecting a judgmental attitude that assumes a position of superiority or the right to demand a course of conduct. It is judgmentalism. It is that sense that we look down on another person and we view them as morally inferior and ourselves as having a right of evaluation that belongs to God alone. It's not that we can't discern their sin. It's that we discern it as a fellow sinner rather than as one who is above them and evaluating them. What he's rejecting here a disposition that's fueled by arrogance, as if the people around us owe us a certain behavior or must conform to our desires or preferences. That, that's what he's, he's condemning here, saying, look, there's, there's, there's nothing in a, a judgmental attitude towards others that positions yourself as their evaluator and looking down upon them rather than looking next to them and positioning yourself alongside them as a fellow sinner equally in need of mercy. It's the, it's the disposition of the heart that he is rejecting and any actions that flow out of that kind of disposition. 
Now, judgment obviously is contrary to the mercy we have received. Why is it bad? Well, it's, it, we've just talked about the God who is merciful. So in a, in a similar way to the parable, which you may have read, of the unforgiving or the unmerciful servant, part of the offense of that statement is that this, this sinner has received overwhelming mercy and yet holds judgment over this person for their wrongdoing. So it, it's, it's a contradiction to the mercies we've received. To stand at the foot of the cross of Christ, which every Christian does in every moment of their life actually, and to look at a fellow sinner and be uh, so offended and shocked and surprised and disgusted by their sin is in itself offensive to heaven. Because the only person who had a right to look down on others as though morally superior was hanging on the cross. Judgment is contrary to the mercy we have received. It's contrary to mercy because judgment forgets the cost of God's mercy toward us. It acts as though the sins and weaknesses of others are far more offensive than our sins against God. Judgment is also wrong because it is seeking to take God's place. You see this actually throughout the scriptures. Often judgment is referred to as a, a claiming the place of God. It's, it's a helpful way to think about it, to distinguish it from just ordinary helpful correction and input and observation. Judgment is not just doing that as a fellow sinner. It's, it's taking God's place. It's assuming that like God, I have the right to evaluate you. You owe me something in your life. When the scripture teaches, look, no one, no one owes me anything. No one belongs to me. I, I can point them to what God says they should do, but I don't actually have the right of ownership over anyone. That's God's and God's alone. This is what it says, for example, in Romans 2. See if you can see the logic about the evil of judgment. Therefore, Paul says, you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges, for in, listen, passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. So that's the first point I was making. It's contrary to the mercy we received as sinners. But listen to this. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Listen, do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Listen to this from Romans 14. It says this. Who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It's a rhetorical question. The answer is, I'm nobody to be passing judgment on the servant of another. It's the servant of another. So to try to pass judgment on them is to try to take God's place. A judgmental attitude that looks down at others is usurping the sovereignty of God. It is contending for the supremacy with him. It is before his own master, Paul says, that he stands or falls, and he will be upheld, for the Lord is able to make him stand. Or James 5, 9, do not grumble against one another, brothers. Often judgment is expressed through grumbling, I think. Do not grumble against one another, brothers. Listen, so that you may not be judged, behold, the judge is standing at the door. So judgment, grumbling against someone in a, in a morally superior sort of way. What, what's, what's it forgetting? There is a judge, and we are not him. So the, the ultimate offensiveness of judging is that we are attempting to, to bump God off of his throne and get comfortable there for a while. We need to see it that way. From a spiritual standpoint, a judgmental attitude is asking God to step off his throne and settling in and rendering verdicts. It is that offensive to God. I think that's why James says, if you function this way, if this is your way of life, just move God over and I'm going to sit here, I'm going to render judgments. You are in danger of judgment because no one can contend for supremacy with God in their heart or in their life that isn't in danger of finally realizing who the real judge is. The point seems to be, look, if, if, if you want to contend for supremacy in this life, you, you have the option of trying. But there will be a day when the world will be turned right side up 
when those who have claimed the place of God in judgment as a lifestyle will be shown to not be the judge, and the one who is the judge will be revealed as the righteous judge, the one who has the right of granting verdicts and declaring pardons and, and announcing sins. That, that, that's what's going to happen in the end. That's why, why James is saying, don't, don't do this, because if you function this way, you are contending with God, and the judge will finally put you in your place. Imagine how ridiculous that would be. If, if there in the courtroom, there's a number of, of people on, on trial, and, and one of the people is, is there, and the, the other person that's further back in the docket, he suddenly stands up and goes to the front of the courtroom and says, you know, judge, I, I, I think I have a great perspective on this case. Would you mind stepping down? I would like to now uh, render a ruling. What would they say? Get down right now. Go away. Wait your turn to be judged. Well, no, no, I, but really, I mean, I've seen this guy, and I've got some, I think I know the best consequence for him. I think I know how he should be, I think I, sh I, I know the perspective uh, that you should have on him, and I, I have on, I need to tell other people of that perspective, and I think I, I need to communicate that. I, I have the right to do that. Listen, it's, it's ridiculous in a human court. It is abominable in heaven. Could, could there be anything more serious than contending with God for the right to evaluate his own people? I think this is why Jesus offers this promise that is simultaneously a warning. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Condemn not, and you will not be condemned. Actually, the grammar uh, could also be translated, stop judging. It, it, it sort of assumes that there's been judging, and you just stop it. Stop judging, and you will not be judged. Now, very important caveat, obviously, a life that avoids judgment um, is not somehow earning its way to heaven. What, what Jesus is doing here is he's stepping back and he's looking at God's absolutely necessary reality that those who are justified will be sanctified, that those who are actually saved by mercy will increasingly grow in mercy, that those who recognize God as the one and only judge will not try to usurp his place. He's simply stating the fact that, look, if, if you don't judge as a lifestyle, as my disciple, then you can have confidence in the end that you will receive the mercy that is revealed and reflected in your treatment of others. But, but the, the subtle and not so subtle warning is, if you try to usurp God's place as a lifestyle and function in judgment of others, then there will be a divine, just fairness where that is reversed, and you will suddenly experience who the real judge is. We, we don't want to weaken this. We don't want to soften this. Those who will not finally be judged are those who do not spend a lifetime judging. They won't thereby earn their salvation, but it is just the case. It is just a fact. If we could look down at the world from God's eternity where he sees the future and the past, and he knows who's, those who are actually his, and those who just profess to be his, and he says, look, I, I can tell you right now, it's the case. Those who finally will be in heaven and prove the genuineness of their conversion will be those that consistently sought mercy instead of judgment in their lifestyle. Because you cannot encounter the cross of Christ and live with Jesus Christ indwelling you by his spirit and abiding in the vine of the mercy of God and continually produce judgmentalism. From a heavenly standpoint, that is impossible. That is as impossible as a, a grapevine that produces figs, or a fresh spring that produces salt water. What does this do for Christians who struggle and are tempted by judgmentalism, which frankly is every single one of us? What, what do we do with that? Well, I do think there should be an element of the fear of the Lord. Warnings and these kind of extreme descriptions in Scripture of how God will operate in this world, they, they, they have an effect on a living person, just like a real sign does. Do you know that a corpse doesn't notice warning signs? You know that? So warnings have no effect on a dead person, but they sober a living person. 
And that person hearing the warning turns and changes. So it doesn't mean that the, the, the sign should have no effect on us. It should have the desired effect to remind us that we live under the fear of God and under the gaze of God and in the shadow of the cross. And we should reject those things that will in the end prove to be the condemnation of those who have indulged them as a lifestyle. What does this mean for a Christian who is convicted of a, a way of, of thinking and a, indulging judgmentalism? It means that there should be immediate repentance of that lifestyle and a, a radical turn towards mercy so that in that turn there can be the revelation that yes, yes indeed, I have encountered the mercy of God. It, it means there should be immediate repentance. And, and thankfully, because God is merciful, when we repent of our judgmentalism, he will extend mercy to that. I think it's possible that in here Jesus is also referring to uh, the, the likelihood that, it, look, if, it, it may just be true in human experience, that the more judgmental you are, the more likely it is you are going to experience judgmentalism in return. So you, you may experience this even in this life. I don't think it's like a guarantee. Look, as long as you're merciful, you'll experience mercy. No, but, but it, it often is the case that the more we cultivate judgmentalism and criticism, uh, the more harsh others tend to be towards us, certainly easier for them to be harsh towards us. But I think ultimately this finds fulfillment in the end in the just verdicts of the final day. God will look at his people and he will foundationally see the righteousness of his son, but, but he will also see the result of his grace at work in them. He, he's, he is going to see a, a lived out righteousness on that day, not, not perfect and still with a lot of gaping holes in it, so it's not the, the earning of our salvation, but he will be able to say, yes, look, look at my, my people who genuinely have followed me and genuinely have, have sought to, to, to honor me. And we want that to be true of us in judgmentalism. We want to be able to offer to the Lord genuine and legitimate growth in this area as an offering to him. Trust me, when we get to heaven, we won't be the least judgmental person there. There's going to be somebody much more mature than us in this area. But we should be less judgmental and much more merciful than we were when we first got saved. Because we should have been growing in that. Are a few applications here. How do we diagnose a judgmental heart? Let me just give you a bunch of a bunch of questions. We diagnose this when we are shocked or surprised by others' weaknesses. Why would you do that? Often the sign of a judgmental heart. We correct or react negatively first and ask questions to understand later. We often admonish more severely than the occasion warrants. We are annoyed by people's weaknesses, even if it doesn't reflect on us. It doesn't have anything to do with me. I'm just... Annoyed that they do it that way. We assume, the, we assume the worst and we are slow to see change. We assume we can see motives rather than just observe actions. We find it easy to remember and meditate on others' sins and weaknesses. We complain naturally, and we're thankful sparingly. We punish people with distance, silence, or anger when they fail us. What do all those things have in common? They're the kind of thing that a deity has the right to do. So many roles that could express these things. A critical husband, 
a nagging wife, a lecturing parent, a cultural critic, quick to critique with a self-righteous demeanor the failures and sins of others, even if it's just them. A whispering gossip. How do we treat a judgmental heart? The absolute first and most important thing is study the mercy of God. Study the mercy of God. And study the judgment of God. Gratefulness and the fear of the Lord should drive out judgmentalism. It is God's right to judge and not mine. And you can study those things best by standing at the cross of Jesus Christ where God was simultaneously more merciful than we could imagine and more holy in judging sin than we could ever think. Practically, relate weakness to weakness. It's easy for a judgmental person to relate an area to an area. I'm good at this, they're bad, I think their weakness is unreasonable. Compare weakness to weakness. Compare where you are weak to their weakness. And you'll find mercy growing in your heart. Where does it take you years to change? Compare that to their area in need of change. Don't compare area to area, administration to administration, kindness to kindness, speech to speech. Compare weakness to weakness. And you'll experience a different lens of evaluation. Finally, ask more questions. There's a practical recommendation flowing from that camping out at the cross. Ask more questions. Judgmentalism thrives on assumptions and rash decisions and deductions. Ask more questions. Genuine questions. Try to understand. Mercy seeks to be present with, not to look down upon. Brothers and sisters, all of us have some person, some area in our life where judgmentalism has taken a hold. All of us have some area where that is true. All of us have some place we can look to and point out where we've been sinned against. And it's very difficult not to allow that sin to, to leave us in this place of, of judgmentalism and the, the quickness to be cynical towards others. So very, very easy to, to look at that spot. Let me encourage us. Let's go together to the cross of Jesus Christ. Let's linger there. Let's remember who is speaking to us. And let us make our relationships, our heart, and our church a place where that cross teaches us humility, graciousness, patience, and mercy. It's a glorious thing to show mercy under the gaze of the one who showed mercy to us. Let's pray. Bearing shame and scoffing rude, in my place condemned he stood, sealed my pardon with his blood. Hallelujah, what a savior. Lord Jesus, when we are aware and convicted of our own tendency towards judgmentalism, Lord, it, it firstly just makes us amazed at the level of your mercy. Lord, it's so good that we have a merciful savior. Because we are not merciful. Lord, it's sinful. 
Lord, our self-righteous reactions are sinful and abominable in heaven. But Lord, you don't treat us as our sins deserve. And you are merciful to us even when we repent of self-righteousness and judgment. Lord, of all the ironies, thank you for being merciful. But we, we repent of pride. We repent of judging others, assuming their motives, quick to criticize. Lord, please forgive us. And thank you that you do. And thank you that, Lord, you already bore the weight and the punishment of all of our judgmental thoughts. Every single one was represented in your cross. And you rose again, Lord. And now we have a new life in you. And from you, Lord, we receive the merciful, life-giving, Lord, spirit that you send to us and that recreates us and makes us new, makes us, Lord, quick to show mercy, quick to forgive, quick to love those who have not loved us, quick to extend well-being, Lord, we've been treated wrongly. Lord, like you, Lord, we don't have to make it up. It flows from you. It flows from your spirit. It flows from your cross. Lord, it's your life that is being revealed in us, Lord. So we, we, Lord, we cling to you. We repent and we receive your forgiveness that you've paid for these sins. And we, we ask, Lord, that your life-giving spirit would flow out of us and would produce mercy through us. Make us a merciful people. Thank you for your mercy that is new every morning along the way. In Jesus' name, in your name, Lord Jesus, we are offering these prayers. Father, help us. Lord Jesus, help us. Spirit, fill us. Trying God, make us like you. things um, if um, all of us have areas of conviction but I always want to make available we want to make available um, if if you feel like this is an area that you would honestly say it more characterizes a lot of the way you relate to others not just occasional it seems like more consistent um, please come forward Let, let's just acknowledge uh, together that we need prayer and help and repentance and and let's just pray for you it doesn't have to be longer than that, but that's just a moment of acknowledging, I, I need help in this area. There's a, there's a situation or there's an area um, in my life I need prayer. Please come forward and do that. Um, for, for the rest of us, just as a reminder, the new bookstore is open. Um, and we hope that serves you. Feel free to go there, back there and browse and, and, and purchase if something would, would bless you and serve you. Have a grace-filled week.